Hello, everyone. Welcome to the second installment of our Breakfast Club series. Uh, we're joined today by Dr. Lauren Esposito, arachnology curator at the California Academy of Sciences. Hey, Lauren. Hey, how's it going? Pretty good. Um, so before I hand this over to Lauren, three really quick orders of business. First, we got a question about whether this talk is suitable for children. Uh, the answer is yes, all of our Breakfast Club talks will be, with the caveat that we are talking about arachnid courtship and reproduction, so everyone watching should be pretty comfortable with the fact that that doesn't happen by stork. Uh, next item, our previous Breakfast Club speaker, botanist Natalie Nagalingham, asked viewers to help her um, name her pet fern, and they did such an amazing job at that that we are going to ask for your help again today. So meet the scorpion previously known as Tina. Uh, please don't try holding scorpions at home. This one is an ambassador scorpion that Lauren uses in education programs. Um, actually, Lauren, you want to just tell us a little more about her? Sure. So Tina's a, a new arrival to our, our arachnology lab at the Cal Academy. Um, we usually have one or two animals that we keep around as sort of lab mascots, and we like to take them out when we're introducing people to arachnids and the fact that maybe they're not quite as scary as they thought they were. Um, Tina formerly Tina, is an African flat rock scorpion. So she's from Southern Africa. Um, and she's quite quite rotund in this picture because she's probably pregnant. Um, and she also very interestingly, or at least interestingly to me, has a genetic abnormality where one of her feet, uh, in one of her legs ends at the first segment. So she, she doesn't have a fully articulated leg, um, but I think it just makes her so much cuter. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, so if that inspired you to think of a name for this clearly magnificent beast, uh, just leave it in the comments section at any point during this broadcast, and uh, we'll read them back to Lauren at the end. And you know what? If she's inspired to pick a favorite, I'm going to give that person two tickets to our new Venom exhibit, redeemable as soon as we reopen, so that you can see lots of uh, live scorpions in person and also learn more about Lauren's work. Okay, very last thing, uh, a reminder that if you're watching this broadcast live, whether on Facebook or YouTube, you can ask questions at any point by just leaving them in the comments section. Uh, I'll keep an eye on those, and at the end of Lauren's talk, we'll loop back and ask her as many as we can. And even if you don't have a question, it's really nice to just leave a hello or a where you're watching from in comments, because Lauren can't see anyone but herself when she's talking, and that's a really nice way to let her know that you're out there. So without further ado, Dr. Lauren Esposito with When the Lights Go Out, Arachnid Sex. So first, I'd just like to say a huge thank you to our social media team at the Academy for making this happen and allowing us scientists who are stuck at home to still engage with all of you out there outside of the museum. So I want to talk to you today about arachnids, which I'm, as the curator of arachnology at the California Academy, I love arachnids. Um, I don't know that that's a feeling that most people share. Most people, when they think they hear the word arachnid, assuming they know what it means, they think right away of something terrifying that's going to fly across the room and most certainly bite you and it's going to cause great emotional distress and pain. But when I think about arachnids, the first thing that comes to mind is something like this giant tarantula. This is a, a, an arboreal tarantula, tree dwelling. And when I look at it, rather than seeing something terrifying, I think of something that looks like a little puppy. Like this guy's not going to jump across the room. He moves really slow. He lives a really long time. And what he's really just looking for is a snack. So with, with that, I would like to introduce you to the world of arachnids and really what fascinates me about arachnids so much. So the first thing is, <clears throat> if you've ever heard of arachnids, the first thing that comes to mind, I'm sure, is a scorpion or a spider. Those are the things that we're most familiar with. Um, but there's actually a whole lot of different groups of arachnids. Arachnids include, as this little boy is illustrating, holding this upside down book that contains a tree of arachnid life. They include groups like mites and harvestmen, uh, ticks are arachnids. And there was even a paper published uh, just last year that, that informed us that based on genetics, we might now consider horseshoe crabs as true arachnids, being one of the only marine lineages of arachnids. So there's all sorts of different things. Most of them you've never heard of. Um, but you probably have encountered, even if you haven't noticed them, because they're really tiny, something like a book louse, I mean, a book scorpion, or, or sometimes called the pseudoscorpion, which is a little tiny thing that you can often find under the bark of trees. Um, and even Aristotle wrote about finding these book scorpions in the, in the scrolls that he was writing, and because they were preying on the 
on the book louse that, that fed on the paper. Um, but what, what really draws me to scorpions and what's fascinated me so much about scorpions and arachnids generally, sorry, I study scorpions, so I'm always a little bit biased, um, but is really the behavior. So the behavior of arachnids is something that's absolutely fascinating. And while I'm really an evolutionary biologist, I mostly study the patterns and processes of these organisms on Earth. What's drawn me into them is the incredible array of behaviors that they exhibit. So starting with this guy right here, this, this is a, a flatty spider, a researcher that works at the Cal Academy, is the world's expert on, on flatty spiders, Dr. Sarah Cruz. And this spider doesn't make webs like you think of spiders. It lives sort of a cursorial life where it just roams around trying to hide in crevices and cracks and it moves incredibly fast. And that's what it uses to capture prey rather than silk. One of the really incredible things about flatty spiders and arachnids in general is that we're still discovering so much about them. For the large majority of spiders, we don't know basic information about their natural history or their behavior or their methods of reproduction or how they capture prey. We really just know general ideas. And for, a, for many of the spider species that we've discovered so far, we've only ever found and been able to scientifically document a single individual specimen. So we don't even necessarily know what both sexes look like. So flatty spiders are remarkable because they're the, they have the fastest rotational movement of any living animal. And so what they do is they sit on, on, a, on a base of a tree or a rock, just like this one's doing here, and they spread their legs out all around them so that they have equal legs distributed around their body. And that's really important for, for a big reason. Most spiders have structures on the bottom of their feet called slits and scilla. And what slits and scilla are is basically ears on your feet. It allows them to, to hear vibratory signals that are being sent through the ground that they're standing on. And so spiders that are standing on their web can hear these vibratory signals through their web. Spiders that are standing on the bark of a tree can hear these vibratory signals being sent through the, through the tree. And this, this structure is so sensitive that allows them to hear something as, as small as the walking sounds or the walking vibrations that are sent out by an insect or a prey item that it's walking by. And so with these, these legs evenly distributed around its body, the flatty spider is able to hear the direction of approaching prey. And you can see it blends in really well. It's just an ambush predator. It's sitting there waiting for something to get close enough. And when it does, it does this really incredible thing. And I'm gonna play this video. So I said that the fastest rotational movement of any living animal, this is a, high, this is a video shot with high-speed video um, by Dr. Sarah Cruz. And uh, what, what she did is, is she shot it, I think about 20,000 frames per second and then slowed down the playback because otherwise we wouldn't be able to see this movement um, with our own eyes. It would happen in the, literally the blink of an eye. So what you can see there is that this spider is spinning around and reorienting itself to the direction of the prey that's walking by. I'll play this one more time for you just to see. <clears throat> so it's gonna pivot those legs, turn around and land on the, on the cricket. And, and what Sarah's done that's really remarkable is she's taken these high-speed videos and she's analyzed them frame by frame to see where the position of every single leg is through time. And what she discovered is the way that they're enacting this movement is that they're, they're planting the leg that's closest to the oncoming prey item. And then they're throwing all the other legs up in the air and tucking them in and allowing themselves to spin. Basically how a figure skater does a pirouette. It, they plant a foot, tuck, throw their leg up, tuck it in to increase the centripetal force, and then when they're ready to stop, they throw their leg back out to, to plant and firmly remain in position. And this is exactly what the spider's doing. It's doing it much faster than a figure skater. Uh, the, the speed at which this spider is capable of moving is about the same speed as a DVD spinning and a DVD player. It's about 5,400 rotations per second. And it's incredibly fast, and in fact, the fastest rotational movement of any, any living animal. And what's really exciting for us is that now Sarah is taking what she's learned from high-speed videoing these spiders and working with a physicist 
to try to understand the mechanisms behind how they're able to to uh, initiate this kind of movement with such force, because really it's a force that defies the way that muscles work in the body of a spider. But what I wanna talk to you about is some really bizarre things that spiders do. <clears throat> and I think the most bizarre of all is the way that spiders reproduce. This is a, a, a reproducing spider. The, the one on the top is up here is a, oop, I can use my pointer, is the female and down here is the male. And that's really true of almost all, arach all arachnids is that the females are almost always bigger. That's, that's not a universal rule, but it's, but it's almost always true. And I just wanna give you guys a really quick uh, anatomy lesson about spiders because when we talk about spider reproduction, it's important to know where that takes place. So the first, here's a spider. This is sort of a cross section through a spider. And there's two important parts. The first is this part right here, which is um, where the genital opening is for both the sperm and the ovaries. Um, so if you wanna get sperm out or you wanna put uh, uh, sperm in to the ovaries, this is, this is where it comes from. And this is also where the spider lays the eggs. Over here is what we call the palps. Uh, and the palps are, are a structure that looks kind of like a tiny leg. It's present in, in almost all arachnids, but in varying uh, conformations. For example, the palps of a scorpion are the scorpion claws, but spiders use palps for a very different reason. In spiders, the male spider has a modified palp that it uses to transfer sperm from himself to the female. So they have indirect sperm transfer. So the, what happens is the male spider builds this little tiny web, we call it a sperm web, where he deposits sperm and then he does what we call charging the palp. So he sucks that sperm up basically into his palp and then he's ready to reproduce whenever he encounters a female. Okay, so with that, let's take a look at, at spider reproduction in action. So what we're seeing here is a black widow spider. Most of you guys are probably familiar. If you've heard anything about spider reproduction, you've probably heard about spider reproduction of black widows. Uh, the, the, the classic tale is that the black widow female eats the male. So this guy that we're seeing right now, up in the up in the now sort of in the top middle of the screen is the male. You can see the female, she's much, much bigger than he is. And what he's doing now is he's inserting his palp into what we call her opiginum or her genital opening. And in the case of black widow spiders, not always, but almost always the female eats the male following uh, insemination. And that's significant for, for, for a pretty big reason. And the, the thing that we, assume or the, the the prevailing hypothesis about why male spiders would be consumed by female spiders is a really simple one. It's that in these most of these spiders are annual living, uh, especially spiders like black widows. They live for a season and then the female will lay eggs and those eggs will hatch at the beginning of the next annual season. So sometimes they overwinter before hatching or they wait for the wet season to come back around and skip the dry season because they're not gonna survive and thrive during those periods of time. But for a spider that only lives for a season, they're not gonna reproduce each year. And so by allowing the female to consume him, what the male is doing is providing direct nutritional value to his future offspring. So he's improving their likelihood of success by giving them important nutrition for those eggs as soon as she lays them. And that's really the main hypothesis that we consider when we think about spiders reproducing and the female eating the male, that sort of classic tale. But it's not always the case. So here's another example. This is an example of a, of a female spider to the right, a male spider to the left. And in this ex example, again, the female's a bit larger than him. These are um, fishing spiders. And the, the male is holding in his jaws a little silk wrapped gift. Uh, and so in, in some spiders, we've observed that rather than becoming the prey, especially spiders that have longer seasons or, or don't just live annually, they live for multiple years, the male, in this case, wraps up a gift, a prey, and brings it to the female as sort of a peace offering. He's providing her with some nutritional value. He's providing his offspring with some nutritional value. Uh, and in return, she doesn't eat him, and he's able to successfully court with her. He's able to successfully court her. But what's really interesting is because scientists, as 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 uh, sort of inquisitive and and wondering in nature, I think, 
some scientists decided that they wanted to know what actually the nutritional value of of these these peace offerings was. Um, and so a few people, some researchers, uh, collected a bunch of these spiders from the wild or observed them in the wild. And as the male was courting the female, they took that peace offering away. They took that, what we call a nuptial gift away. And they cut it open and they measured the nutritional value because they wanted to know whether it was really equated with the body of a male spider, which can be a quite substantial meal. And what they found was that in many cases, those nuptial gifts were substantial. There was a large fly or a moth or some other insect prey item that these spiders eat. Um, but in about half the cases, the spiders were actually just rewrapping a prey that they had already eaten or a piece of leaf or a rock. And so it was really like a dishonest gift. Um, and so it, it seems like in this case, at least some of the spiders are really honest and, and others aren't and it's really um, I guess just how well you wrap your gift that, that makes a difference. Uh, here's, here's another video that I'm gonna play. These are wolf spiders, they're related to fishing spiders. Um, and this is some research done by uh, Dr. Eileen Hebbets, who's, who's at University of Nebraska. And what you can see here with the green tipped abdomen is the male spider. And he's got this female spider flipped over onto her back. And this is sort of a different reproductive strategy where instead of presenting a gift, what this male spider is presenting is a submissive female who's who's allowing herself to be wrapped in silk. Uh, they call it we call it a bridal veil. Scientists have lots of creative names for things, I suppose. Um, and essentially, what happens is that this female spider is much bigger than him, and he runs up to her as in, in initiating the courtship. He runs straight up to her, and he grabs onto her mouth with his mouth parts. He doesn't bite her, he just sort of interlocks his jaws with her, her jaws. And when that happens, she immediately goes kind of limp and puts her legs back and allows him to start wrapping her in silk, just like he would a prey item, although the silk is much more loosely wrapped. Um, and she, the thing is, is, is th this sounds a little strange maybe, but, but in reality, she can just stand up. She's bigger than him, the silk is loosely wrapped, and she can just break that silk and stand up and she could easily overpower him and eat him if she wanted. Um, but but somehow through um, evolution and and uh, sexual selection, these females have adopted this strategy of just allowing the male to have some extra measure of security when he uh, courts with her. Here's another video again, uh, some research by Dr. Eileen Hebbets. Uh, this is again some some wolf spiders. Uh, in this case, the male's even even smaller than the female, and and I think that this is an even more extreme case. So perhaps when when um, when sexual evolution occurs, it occurs in all different sorts of ways. It occurs in in ways where the male wraps the female with silk. It occurs in ways where uh, the male allows himself to be eaten. Um, and I think that this is one of the more bizarre ones. So again, this is the female spider. She's really big. The male spider's on top of her. He's quite small. Uh, and in this case, the male spider is going to reach around with his palps and he's going to insert his palp into her epigenum. And when that happens, the spider goes completely limp. And you can see this again in slow motion. He just, he, in this case, rather than she, just stops moving, utterly stops. And what is actually happening in this scenario is that the male is spontaneously committing suicide following the copulation act. Uh, he's actually just dies. Right there on the spot, mid copulation, the male spider dies. And um, there, there, there's some, I think there was some real confusion when this behavior was first observed. Uh, but when you start to think about it, it makes quite a lot of sense. We're gonna see in just a minute some other examples of this, but one of the things that one of the methods oftentimes has evolved is this idea of genital plugging to ensure paternity. Um, and basically what that means is that the male spider or scorpion, it happens in a whole bunch of different arachnid organ, uh, groups, creates some sort of plug to prevent future suitors from successfully mating with a female. And sometimes that plug can be removed easily and other times it can't. Uh, in this case, this male spider, by spontaneously committing suicide mid copulation, is su is successfully plugging the female's genital opening, preventing other suitors from coming along after his death. At the same time, what he's doing is offering up some future nutritional value because these female spiders eventually get the male spider off of her, 
Um, the, the plug remains intact because it's usually just a part of his palp, but she's able to consume his body. And, I, and the research shows that she almost always does. And that provides not only uh, in, ensuring your paternity, but uh, ensuring that there's additional nutrition provided for your future offspring. Okay, what do we have next? So uh, here's and here's a picture, a close-up picture. You can remember I showed you this picture in the beginning of the talk, but I didn't mention that this spider right here is the male spider. He's already dead, and the female spider is here, uh, and he's plugging her genital operculum. This is pre-removal of the male um, and consumption of him. <clears throat> and you know, there's this idea that. Many of these behaviors have arisen through a, an idea of sexual conflict. And what sexual conflict says is that if you produce eggs, it's really expensive for you to, in, to, to produce those eggs. It, it requires a lot more energetic investment and you have fewer of them over your lifetime. So for, for most females in the animal world, what you want is to make sure that you're finding the highest quality suitor to make sure that those precious eggs, that precious cargo gets the best genes that it can get. Whereas for males, sperm is really inexpensive. You can produce sperm throughout your lifetime. You don't have a fixed number. It's really cheap to produce um, in terms of how much energy is required. And so for males, the best strategy is to mate with as many females as possible. So there's this conflict where females are trying to ensure the highest quality and males are trying to ensure the greatest number. And over time, it develops these things where females want choice and males want to reproduce freely. And so I think none is more bizarre. No, no sort of sexual competition is more bizarre than the case of this spider. It's called Harpactica sadistica. Um, it's, it's really, I think, the epitome. I'm going to play this, this video and sort of narrate it for you. So what you can see here is you're looking through the bottom of a female abdomen. This is the back of her sort of butt of the spider. Here's the male's palps. Again, the males, they kind of have these, these little legs, but they're tipped with like these, these boxing glove looking structures. And that's, that's the sperm transfer structure of the palp. And what you can see now is that he's, he's actually, it looks like he's digging. And what he is, is actually digging. He, he has a structure on the end of his palp that is sort of a saw and it cuts a hole through the abdomen of the female. This is a, a behavior called traumatic insemination. And he has to cut a hole through her exoskeleton, through her cuticle, in order to get to her the opening of her, of her um, ovaries, and and it's really uh, I think an extreme example where where it, maybe it sounds really like awful and 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 super traumatic, and I, no doubt it is, but it's also necessary because the female has no natural opening to her gen to her genitals. So she's unable to lay eggs unless a male cuts this hole, providing access in and out of her reproductive system. And so here's a, a sort of magnified view. This is the tip of his, of his palp. And you can see there's kind of this spade shaped uh, structure that allows him to cut through the cuticle. And this is actually where the sperm comes out. It's it's a, a, a like a hypodermic needle that pierces into um, her exoskeleton, and uh, and allows him to directly uh, insert sperm into her reproductive system. Here's a here's a, a picture of the spiders themselves, which is kind of an interesting one. In this case, the the male is on the on the upper left, and the female is on the bottom right. And you can see that that usual that uh, ordinary size. Um, pattern that we see in arachnids where almost always females are larger than males is reversed. In this case, the male is larger than the female. Um, and and the, the story gets even more bizarre because what these spiders do is the male runs up to the female, he bites her and injects some venom that's an anesthetic and it puts her to sleep. It puts her into an uh, um, under anesthesia essentially. And then he drags her back into a burrow where he performs this sort of sexual surgery in order to open her reproductive system and, and just deposit his sperm. I think it's really like the epitome of sexual conflict, this idea that the, the males and the females have different self-interests where nature has gotten so bizarre that it's evolved to the point that the female no longer has a genital opening so that she um, can essentially can choose, but in the, in this case, it's evolved to the point that she's no longer able to. 
there's some other really extreme examples of, of how there's been uh, evolution that is very different in the two gender, in the two sexes of, of spiders. Um, this is a, a golden silk orb weaver. They're really beautiful spiders. They're the, the largest orb weavers, the, the kinds of spiders that build those big like Charlotte's web sorts of spiral webs. But up in the corner right here, you can see is the male. Uh, and this is an example where there's been gigantism. So, so the females have evolved to be really giant and the males are really tiny and, and quite insignificant compared to the female. And in this case, when reproduction occurs, it's not even totally clear that the female knows that it's occurring. Um, in fact, the males will find, they, they typically develop um, earlier in the season than the females. So they reach adulthood before the females reach adulthood. And they'll seek out the web of a female spider who's just before her final molt before she reaches adulthood. Spiders molt multiple times uh, to shed their old exoskeleton and reform a new one, allowing them to grow larger. And so we call that that last molt the pan ultimate molt. So the one right before the last one, and then they're never gonna molt again in most cases with the exception of tarantulas. And um, so the male will seek out a, a, a female spider that's in her pan ultimate molt, and he'll start living in her web. He doesn't make a web for himself, he just lives in hers at this point. And he keeps other males away, he chases them away. He sort of defends his territory, which is her web that she's constructed. And he eats little little scraps of food like gnats and other kind of insignificant insects that she would never be interested in. And he guards her for his entire life, trying to ensure that no other males are able to mate with her and ensuring his paternity. And she doesn't mind them really at all because he's maybe keeping her web clean for her. Here's another example from that same group. Uh, this, is, this is also a female giant. She's right in the middle. The male's uh, just over here by her head. And what you can see here is another example of those genital plugs or mating plugs. Um, this is actually, uh, may, may look kind of familiar. It's that, it's that leg looking structure with a boxing glove at the end, which is his palp, his reproductive organ, his sperm transfer organ. And it's sticking out of where her genital opening is. Um, and and that's, that's not particularly uncommon. Um, we saw that with, with the wolf spider who, who committed spontaneous suicide, leaving his palp as a genital plug. Um, in this case, the spider is alive and well. He's hanging out with the female, living in her web, cleaning up her mess, and, um, and he's leaving his palp as a genital plug. So this is self-mutilation. He's actually ripped it off after post-courtship, allowing it to stay in there as a plug. And because he lives in her web his whole life, he can stay around ensuring his paternity, defending her, making sure that no other males come into the web attempting to mate because that plug could potentially be dislodged. But um, some researchers started noticing that, that um, some of the males were missing both palps. And so if you've mated with the female and she um, has a genital plug, you wouldn't dislodge that plug on your own. Um, for any reason, because it's as long as it's intact, and she doesn't dislodge it either. She doesn't care about it. Um, but they started noticing these male spiders that were had two palps, and so of course they got to wondering um, whether the spiders were leaving and mating with another female in her web, or or what was going on there. And so they here's one with two, of course. Here's a, a male that has uh, already self mutilated one of his palps, and here's one with no palps. You can see both of those kind of boxing glove structures that we see over here are missing, and. What they found was, um, after really careful observation, was that the males were actually self-mutilating their other palp following a successful insemination event. And so they, they um, of course, were curious, as I think anybody would be, why would they self-mutilate their other palp? What if her, what if her, her reproductive uh, plug, her mating plug, got dislodged and he needed to mate with her again? Like, why would you do that? And so what they did was they took these tiny little spiders and they put them on basically tiny spider treadmills and they tested their strength and endurance. And what they found was that males with two palps were the, the, had the least strength and the least endurance. I mean, look how big those palps are, they're huge. They have to carry them around. It's a significant proportion of their body mass. And males with one palp had sort of an intermediate strength and endurance, but males with no palps had the highest strength and greatest endurance of, of either three of those. And so what that really meant to them was that these palps were self, these, these spiders were self mutilating that second palp to give them greater strength and endurance for defending their territory from other potential males. So they were defending the queen um, and in order to do so became eunuchs. 
But I think perhaps like the epitome of all spider reproduction is in the case of jumping spiders. Jumping spiders are these really adorable spiders. Um, they have really big eyes. They're very visual. Uh, they're also um, uh, 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 cursory predators. So rather than building a web where they sit and wait, they move around through, through their environment, searching for mates and capturing prey. If you've ever seen a jumping spider, um, you probably know exactly what I'm talking about. You can see them sort of hopping around. They're really like the athletes of, of the arachnid world. They can, they can jump like several lengths of their, of their uh, body in one go. And, and, and because they're these really visual hunters, they've evolved these really visual reproductive systems. One of the things that I haven't mentioned yet is that all arachnids court. There's always a courtship ritual between the male and the female where the male is trying to prove to the female or advertise to the female his strength and capability and the quality of his genes uh, because of that sexual conflict where the female always wants to choose. And, and in the case of jumping spiders, they advertise this through visual means. You can see this is, this is a really beautiful peacock spider, the, the, probably the most beautiful of jumping spiders. Because jumping spiders are active during the day, they have really bright colors, oftentimes unlike many other spiders that are nocturnal and, and don't have bright colors because they're not simply not visible at night. And this jumping spider has this beautiful patterned tail and you can see these white tips on his legs that he's holding out. And, and all of that is to get the attention of the female so that he can perform his courtship ritual. Another thing that I haven't mentioned yet is that almost all spiders send acoustic signals when they're courting. So they place music to the female as a signal of their species because it's a particular pattern and rhythm like a bird song or um, as, a, as a, uh, uh, a warning of approach because these female spiders are much larger than the male spiders. He wants to warn her that he's approaching and that his intent is to reproduce, uh, not to eat her. And so please, please don't eat me, the male spider, because I'm a lot smaller than you, the female spider. Peacock spiders um, have th this really cool adaptation where they basically have these flaps on either side of their, of their abdomen that they're able to lift and raise up just like a peacock tail. And that's where they get their name from, peacock spiders. You can see down here, um, in the, in the lower uh, left is a male and female peacock spider mid reproduction. The male is on the bottom and the female's on the top. You can see that he's, he's much smaller than her. He's about half her body size. And because these spiders are able to leap several, uh, a distance of several lengths of their body, if he's courting her from a distance, he has to ensure that that distance is sufficient enough before he approaches because she could easily leap at him grab him and overpower him. And, and many arachnids will take down any prey item that they feel that they can overpower. So really uh, courtship for arachnids is a risky business as, as we've seen in several cases. Um, I'm gonna play a video that I certainly didn't make this video. This video is by a guy named Jurgen Otto and he has a YouTube channel. You can watch amazing, amazing videos of these peacock spiders doing their reproductive courtship uh, rituals. And what these peacock spiders are doing is they're playing a song and a dance simultaneously. It's what we call multimodal communication, using different things like I'm talking to you and waving my hands right now and I'm trying to communicate something to you. And the peacock spiders do the same thing. In this video, we can't hear the sounds that they're producing because it's filmed in nature, but you can see just how elaborate their courtship rituals are. So here's a, a male peacock spider. He can see a female because they're visual. And what he's gonna do first is, is sort of flag her. He's going to wave at her. If you've ever seen a, a jumping spider around your garden or something, oftentimes they're on the walls of your house near your garden, they might wave their palps at you. And then he's going to pop these legs up as, as the first sort of flagging signal. He's like, hey, look over here. Look at me. Look at me. Look at me. I'm a male peacock spider. I'm really interested in you. And he's trying to get her attention from a very safe distance. And what he's looking for is her eyes. He wants to have sustained eye contact. Um, and as soon as she looks away or turns her body and he doesn't have that eye contact anymore, he reorients himself. He jumps to a different limb or jumps to, to a different spot in the environment where he has her attention and he starts the, the ritual all over again. And what's really cool is that each of these dances is species specific. So different species have different elements of their dance that they do at, at a certain point in time during the courtship. And these dances can go on for, for hours. 
Uh, he'll just keep trying over and over again, repeating all of the sequences of his dance over and over again until he gets sustained eye contact all the way through and will only approach her after the final step of his dance has been done successfully. And so this is a sort of a montage of a, of a few different species. All of them are, are doing different elements of their, of their courtship ritual. And eventually, if it's successful, it often includes these kind of shakes and, and leg waves and bobs and putting the tail up and opening the flaps. And uh, if, if he's successful, then he'll finally approach her right at the very end. And again, if you if you want to watch really adorable peacock spider videos, you should look up Jurgen Otto's YouTube channel. I I also failed to mention that what's really remarkable about these videos is that these spiders are really tiny. They're like they're like the size of your pinky nail. Um, so so getting some macro video like this is 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 incredible. And they live in the in the uh, uh, northeast coast of Australia. But what, what you couldn't see in that video was, or rather what you couldn't hear in that video was the music that he was playing that accompanied his dance. And remember way back when I talked to you about flatty spiders and how they have the fastest rotational movement of any living animal, I told you that all spiders have slits and scylla in their feet. And those slits and scylla are really important for listening for acoustic signals. And those acoustic signals are sent by males. We Almost every spider species that's ever been studied has been demonstrated to be sending acoustic signals or vibratory signals through the ground to the female that, that the male's trying to court. And um, that includes spiders sitting on webs. So uh, what, what, I, what I failed to point out and, and, um, and should have remembered to, to tell you when we, were, when we were watching that video of, of the black widow male courting the black widow female was that one of the things that web building spiders do is the male plucks on the strings and sends an acoustic signal through her web, basically playing the harp to the female. Uh, and he does, he plays a specific song, it's species specific, so that she can recognize that he's a male of the same species that's attempting to court her. Otherwise, the moment he entered her web, she would immediately attack him. And it's only because he plays that song that that acoustic signal signals to her that he is attempting to court. And that's true of these jumping spiders too, but what's really exciting about the jumping spiders is that because they're visual, in addition to these acoustic signals, they're basically doing a dance and playing a song at the same time. And so I'm gonna play this video and, and what I want you to, to, to be aware of is a few things. First, these are, these are videos uh, from Dr. Damien Elias. He's a, a researcher at UC Berkeley that studies jumping spider behavior and acoustic signaling or multimodal signaling in, in jumping spiders. And what we're looking at right now is a video of, of a spider courtship arena. And in the foreground, just down here, is the female spider. Actually, these, these jumping spiders, if you've ever seen them waving their palps at you, um, it's because they'll basically try to court anything that's looking at them. As long as they have eye contact, they'll try to court. So this is a, a, a dead female that's, that's on a pin that can be manipulated by researchers to turn. Um, so that she she he loses her eye contact and and uh, observe what happens when he tries to reinitiate courtship. What you can see, kind of around the arena, is these little metal um, uh, uh, like foil dots. And what those foil dots are 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 uh, um, a metal for uh, this piece of equipment called a laser vibrometer to be shot at. And you can see the laser down in the in the bottom left. There's kind of a red dot shining on that metal. And a laser vibrometer is basically a, a piece of equipment that allows you to observe um, sort of micro vibrations. And it's, it's more often used in the aeronautics industry for, for uh, looking at how machine parts are put together, like airplane engines are put together and ensuring that they're, that they're really um, like in sync and that there's no micro vibrations that over time could, could cause the, the wear on the engines. And so this laser vibrometer can pick up the tiniest vibration and that allows us to basically hear the acoustic signals that are being transmitted through the ground rather than through the airwaves, um, through the air uh, to this female spider. And um, what I want you to notice in this video is that the, the, the sounds that you're gonna hear are not being produced by the movements that you're seeing. Those sounds and those movements are independent and they're being coordinated as part of this multimodal courtship that this male is doing to the spider. 
Um, so let's let's take take a look at this, and and I won't be able to talk while it's playing, so so I'll I'll leave it to you to watch and and be amazed. So what I think was the most amazing about that is that you saw he was making all these incredible noises, and this was just a really small clip. Uh, in many cases, these these uh, spiders court for for hours and hours, and so this was sort of late in the courtship ritual where he's approached the female. He's quite close. Um, all those leg waves that he was doing are were tried are trying to coordinate with the sound that he is producing, and the sound is being produced uh, using using uh, his abdomen back in the back, and so they're totally unrelated. This was not the peacock spider. This is another species in the, species of jumping spider from from uh, in Cal from California, actually. And the peacock spider uh, coordinates that tail display along with um, the sound, unlike other spiders that don't have such, such beautiful uh, plumage on their tails. <clears throat> but Spiders are not the only things that court, the only arachnids that court. In fact, almost all arachnids court. And I think probably while spiders uh, uh, have a, a really fascinating array of courtship rituals, they're not quite as refined as scorpions. And, and maybe I'm biased as a scorpion biologist uh, to thinking that scorpions are more refined, but, but uh, I'm gonna play this video for you. These, this is two um, emperor scorpions, which are from, from sort of central Africa. Courting, and what what you can see here is if the video plays, assuming that it plays, because internet. Um, so here's a male a male scorpion. Those are his his claws are are what there is a palp, but they're not used for sperm transfer. Um, scorpions have indirect sperm transfer, so the male deposits a gelatinous stalk on the ground that's tipped with a sperm packet, and the female chooses whether or not to pick up that sperm packet. So the female is. He, the male will run up to the female. He'll grab onto her claws with his claws. Usually she reacts quite angrily, uh, sort of in a threatening display. He typically vibrates his legs before that as sort of a, a pre-warning that he's attempting courtship, but she's almost always heavier than him and could easily overtake him if she wanted to. Then they they uh, proceed to, to do this courtship dance called a pas de deux, where he grabs her hands and sort of like ballroom dancing, leads her around back and forth. He then does this thing called chalicerol massage, where he takes his mouth parts, um, which are facing her mouth parts, and kind of rubs them. So basically, like a like a kiss. Uh, so he's he's kissing her mid dance, and if he does the dance well, if if she approves of his dancing moves, he'll find a suitable place to deposit that that gelatinous structure that he produces, and he'll lead her very gently over his his spermatophores, as it's called. And if, if she thought the dance was done well, she'll dip her body down and pick up the, sp the spermatophore with her genital opening. Um, female scorpions can store sperm, so she doesn't have to use it right away. She can actually go on and allow other suitors to dance with her and decide whether or not she feels that they're superior um, genetic makeup and then choose to use their sperm instead. She has a whole sperm storage um, structure in her body. And that's really important because scorpions are multi-year lived animals. Uh, some scorpions can live upwards of, of 15 or 20 years, and many of them don't reach sexual maturity until they're a few years old. And because scorpions are long lived, there may be periods of time where the environmental conditions aren't favorable, and she may want to wait out those environmental conditions and wait for a period of time in which um, there's more rain or more prey availability before she decides to go ahead and, and become pregnant and have her babies. Scorpions also are, are um, live bearers, which means that they don't lay eggs like most other arachnids. They actually give birth to live young. They become pregnant when the conditions are suitable. And uh, they have a, an overuterus system where those embryos develop. They're basically plugged into her uh, uh, nutrients in the same way that, that um, human, human fetuses are, are, are receiving direct nutrients from 
of their mother as they're developing in the womb, these little scorpions, they're called scorpionlings, are also receiving nutrition from the female. And, and when she gives birth, she continues to care for them. Almost all arachnids exhibit some level of maternal care, uh, or in some cases, paternal care, where either during the development of the eggs before they hatch, or even following the hatching of, of the eggs or the birth, they continue to care for those young and provide some, some security. So what I want to play for you now is, is, is uh, the, the live birth of a scorpion. Um, you can see right here are two little scorpion embryos that have just been birthed out of this female. Um, we're looking up through basically like a pane of glass up into the, the belly of a scorpion. You can see she's very pregnant and you can even kind of see some little, make out some little scorpion eyes right here in her belly. Uh, her cuticle is quite, quite uh, thin because she's very light colored. And you can see over here just barely and not when this little box pops up because I moved my cursor. Um, but you can see that this little tiny scorpionling that's already been birthed and has broken its amniotic sac and has climbed up onto her back. So here's this video. And you can see those, those structures that look like combs are uh, sensory structures that allow them to smell and feel vibrations on the bottom of their, of their body. And just above those kind of comb looking structures is her genital opening. And there's a little baby scorpion that's about to pop right through. And as it does that, it's, it's still covered in an amniotic sac, so it can't quite move yet. It has to break that amniotic sac um, before it's able to move. But, but as soon as it does, it will look just like a tiny little scorpion, just a miniature version. They don't have any kind of um, uh, uh, differences in their development. They're, they're born as little tiny scorpions and they just keep growing throughout their lives. But what the, what the female is doing here is she's, she's forming this thing called a birth basket, which is basically where she uses her, her claws to kind of create this, this safe space for the embryos to fall into as they come out of the, the birth canal. And the, once they break the amniotic sac, they're gonna start climbing up her legs and up her arms, up onto her back. And then they'll stay up on her back until they've molted their exoskeleton for the first time, at which point they'll start to, to disperse. So she lets them grow a little bit, get a little bit bigger, and then they'll slowly start to disperse away from the female. Um, in some species, they'll, they'll kind of hang around for, for many years and not, not necessarily living together, but living very close to one another. In other species, they get as far away as they can um, because oftentimes scorpions are cannibals. So, I think you know what. What's really one of the things that's really drawn me to being interested in arachnids is is the the development of all of these really fascinating behaviors. Um, but there's another really interesting aspect of of arachnids that that I haven't touched on yet, and that's the development of materials. Um, so arachnids make make two primary types of materials. They produce silk, um, and and silk is is a really interesting material in and of itself, it's a, a biomaterial, and they also produce venom. So not, not all arachnids um, make venom, um, but most spiders and all scorpions make venom um, in either their, their, their fangs in the case of spiders or in the tip of their tail and their stinger in the case of scorpions. This spider that we're looking at here is an ogre spider. They're, I think they're my favorite spiders. They're, they're, um, they belong to the group of spiders that includes orb weaving spiders. But they make these, these webs, um, instead of sitting in them, they hold them in their four front legs and they use them. They're sometimes called a net casting spider. They use them as a net that they throw around insects mid-flight. So they dangle from a tiny thread and watching with these big, huge eyes and looking for insects mid-flight to throw this, this web around. And what's really interesting about silk is that it's incredibly tough. Um, spiders produce different kinds of silk for different uses. So they have dragline silk, which is those kind of like radials in the, in the um, orb of an orb weaving spider. And those, that dragline silk, which has to anchor webs to trees and in spite of wind blowing it around and getting strained and stressed. And, and we use this idea of toughness as a way to understand the intersection between strength. So just how strong something is, like the strongest material is, 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 is um, steel. And steel is, is, doesn't uh, allow for very much strain. So uh, when steel, when too much strength is, is placed on steel, it just snaps. It doesn't ever sort of stretch and allow itself to recover. 
Whereas Kevlar has some, some percentage of strain as well. So while it's a really strong material, it's also can undergo some strain. It can be stretched without just snapping. Um, spider silk has greater toughness than both Kevlar and steel. So it's actually the toughest material uh, known to man. But what's probably the most interesting aspect of, of materials that, that spiders produce, at least I think right now, um, is venom. And, and that's because venom is produced to act specifically on the organisms that are, it's intended for. So most spiders and scorpions produce venom that is intended to subdue their prey. It's supposed to stop their prey from, from moving so that, they can, so that they can consume it. Some spiders and scorpions, in addition to, to producing venoms that affect the, the nervous system of prey, that they produce venoms that affect the nervous system of their would-be predators like mammals. Um, so mammals are the thing that mostly eats spiders and scorpions. And so they need to defend themselves. They produce these venoms and these venoms are extremely specific. They function most of the time in one of two ways. They either interrupt the way that nerves signal each other. So they stop your nerves from signaling um, or they force your nerves to signal when you don't want them to. So basically if a scorpion stings your finger, you're, it's gonna inject a venom. That venom is gonna activate your nerves to tell your brain that your hand is being smashed with a sledgehammer or electrocuted when really all that's happened is you've gotten a tiny little poke in your finger. Um, and so basically what they're trying to do is get away from their predators. This is where I, this is my public service announcement of the day, which is that if you unless you live in this area shaded in green on this photo, you don't live anywhere where there's brown recluse spiders. So you don't ever have to worry about being bitten by a brown recluse. Although black widow spiders live in a majority of the country and uh, although bites from them are incredibly, incredibly unusual. So there's, because of the specificity of the venom of, of arachnids, there's actually being, uh, there's all kinds of research being done on the potential therapeutic uses. Um, here's an example that I wanted to share with you uh, from a, a, a scorpion species. And in addition to these, these um, venom peptides in the cocktail of venom that, that arachnids produce, because they produce multiple things in this cocktail of their venom, uh, they produce antimicrobials or things that kill bacteria or break bacteria apart. And, and what we're looking at here is a MRSA infection. MRSA is a, a really bad bacteria that's really common in hospitals. And it can't be, it doesn't respond to modern, to most modern antibiotics. And so it's really hard to cure. Um, and oftentimes results in death or amputation of limbs. And this is uh, in, the, in these pictures here, some mouse skin that's been infected with MRSA. Um, and you can see that uh, this venom peptide is the one in the leftmost column. And, and after four days, the MRSA infection on this mouse skin has been almost completely healed. So the infection is no longer uh, active in the, in the mouse skin that's been treated by the scorpion venom. So that holds a lot of promise for treating bacteria that aren't responding to traditional antibiotics. There's another uh, venom peptide that's being similarly researched uh, as a treatment to drug-resistant chlamydia, um, and that's a, a peptide produced in, in this zotarid spider. There's also examples where venom peptides are being used as uh, to, are being researched as potential cures for things like, like um, uh, 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 arthritis. Um, so here's some, some uh, mice that have arthritis in their feet and they're being treated with uh, a venom peptide from, from this uh, Indian red scorpion. And, and uh, it shows a lot of promise where the, after following treatment with this venom peptide from the Indian red scorpion, the mouse arthritis is, is invaded uh, significantly less and very similar to the, the levels of arthritis observed or inflammation observed in a completely healthy mouse. Here's another great example. This is a, an example of rather than getting nerves to talk to each other, preventing them from talking to each other. Um, this is a tarantula from South America, a blue bottle, blue, blue green tarantula, I think is the name of that one. Common names are tough. Um, and this one is being used as an alternative to opioid uh, painkillers. And the problem with opioids is that over time uh, they lose efficacy because your body becomes accustomed to them. Um, and so you have to take increasingly greater doses plus of course, we know they're very addictive, um, and this is one of the reasons that they're addictive. And this uh, tarantula venom is showing that the efficacy remains even after uh, a significant amount of time of treatment. And so it would be a really great potential for, for uh, non-opioid painkiller. 
And this last example that I wanted to share with you really, really quickly before we run out of time is this uh, example that's, that's the one that's made it the furthest along the pipeline of drug development. So in order to develop a new drug, you have to do a, a ton of research starting with just research on the basic function of what that chemical does then moving into um, mouse models and then um, more complex animal models and finally human drug trials. And um, this is an example where we've made it into human drug trials. It's uh, still not commercially available, but it's it's the furthest along of any arachnid derived venom. This is uh, the Israeli death stalker scorpion and there's a peptide uh, active in its venom that um, for some reason, uh, not certainly not intentionally but in the case of the scorpion, but for some reason targets brain glioma cells and uh, brain, brain glioma is a, a type of cancer that, that occurs in the brain. Um, usually it's treated by surgical extraction. Um, and essentially when they do surgical extraction, what they do is they go and they take out the, 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 the tumor and they keep cutting away at your brain until they have clear margins at the cuts, um, at which point they know that they've removed all of the cancerous tissue and they can stop cutting. But when it comes to brain, and brain tissue, even just a couple, uh, few, a, a few extra cells could be the difference between um, being able to, to speak or understand speech uh, or not. And so um, because this, this uh, toxin targets these brain glioma cells, what, what scientists were able to do was take this toxin and attach to it a fluorescent dye that stains the cancer cells in the brain. And then a surgeon can go in with microsurgical equipment and remove just the cancerous cells and leave all the healthy brain tissue intact. Um, and so that's that, that's showing a lot of promise for the, for the treatment of, of surgical extraction of brain tumors. So what I wanna leave you guys on is why any of this matters. Um, sort of my, my guiding principle in why I study biodiversity um, and why I go around the world discovering new species, trying to understand what's contained in their venom and their bizarre behaviors uh, is because I think that it's really important for us. It's important for us if we want to retain the potential to discover new cures. It's important for us if we want to understand how healthy ecosystems function and ensure that they continue to do so. Um, but because we live during a time when the rate of human development alters the natural environment, uh, scientists like me who study biodiversity are often placed in a race to discover, describe, and collect organisms before they go extinct. And this isn't a race that we're winning. Um, we estimate that among arachnids, we've only discovered somewhere between 30 and 50% of the arachnids in the world. So we have a lot of work left to be done. We discover hundreds of new species every year um, and scientifically document them. But uh, it's, it's a race that we have to do with an increasing um, urgency and, and uh, utilizing all of the technology that's developing at, at our disposal. Um, and this is just a picture of me right here. I'm standing at the bottom of this really, really massive tree that's in the crater of a volcano. Of course, this box popped up um, in the top of an island in the Caribbean. And uh, it's just to say that, that this crater is the only place on earth where this tropical rainforest and all of the spider species contained in it survive. And as we natural alter the natural environment, it's places like this that are going to increasingly disappear. Um, so with that, this this ogre spider is happy to take any of your questions, um, and he can, he's got big eyes, so he can read really well. Uh, and if you want to follow what our lab is doing, um, you can follow us on Twitter at Arachnology Nerd or on Instagram at, at Cass Arach Nerds. Uh, and I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, Hopefully you enjoyed learning about some spider behavior. <laughs> oh, they have questions. And also uh, that reproduction section got really real, like a little realer than we talked about. <laughs> so we'll see what happens <laughs> <out> later. <laughs> but um, yeah, so we got a ton of questions. I will say Tina is gonna remain named Tina for now because I think people were just like too intimidated by how beautiful she was, which makes sense to me. That's, I mean, that's fair. She is really beautiful. Yeah, she is. And in person, I mean, her soul really comes at you. So, okay. We also, I should say, got a bunch of requests for a follow-up talk on arachnid maternal care. So that's okay. something that you should work on. Uh, first question from Lillian. Um, why is the flatty spider's movement so unique from the typical muscle capabilities of spiders? Um, well, what's really crazy about the rotational movement of the flatty spiders is that is that you wouldn't necessarily want to be flat in order to exert a rotational movement. Um, you would want to be kind of tall, like a figure oh, right. skater. 
that yeah. allows you to, to, to uh, generate this really fast centripetal force. And so because they're super flat and super fast, it's like kind of uh, like a quandary, like why, like that that's not the right way to do things if you wanna be fast, um, especially rotationally fast. Um, and and so the other thing to know about spiders and how they move is is spiders extend their legs by pumping blood into their legs. They don't actually have muscles that that pull their legs, stretch their legs out. And so like if you've ever seen a spider dead, like you've noticed like it has all yeah. the legs curled up, that's because their blood's not pumping anymore, and so they're not able to extend their legs. So they have muscles to contract their legs and squeeze the blood out of their legs, but not muscles to extend them. Um, and so like all of these things, like the the um, the the angles of the fulcra for uh, exerting the the movement, um, the way that that muscles work in spider legs, and the the shape of the flatness is just all wrong if you want to spin. But they're really good at it. Oh, weird. Is Sarah working on that? I'm trying to understand. Yes. That? Yeah, Sarah's working. She's been working with a physicist uh, to try to understand exactly how how they're doing this. Oh, cool. Okay. So more later. Um, Jake wants to know, I know you get this question a lot. Do spiders really crawl into your mouth when you sleep? No. I mean, <laughs> here's, look, look I, I've never like set up a camera to, to monitor whether spiders cr are crawling into people's mouth at night. But what I will say is that first spiders don't want to be around humans. Like they don't, they really don't. Like you're a predator, you're super dangerous. They can feel your like giant vibrating footsteps as you walk around and are like probably terrified they most certainly do not want to crawl into like a, a a dank steamy pit in the middle of the night that's like exuding carbon dioxide out of it like there's nothing appealing about that to spiders so i don't know yeah. where this idea came from that spiders crawl into your mouth when you're sleeping like i would say absolutely not that makes a lot of sense but also as someone who has a mouth i'm kind of offended by the way you just described mouths. i mean people like <laughs> look everyone make, wakes up with morning breath so like yeah. suddenly your mouth does not smell good in the middle of the night i don't right. know if spiders can smell it exactly but they can certainly sense that there's like a ton of co2 pouring out of it that they don't want to be up in yeah okay um that sounds like that's decisively answered what is the largest, Judy, I'm sorry, Judy wants to know, um, what is the largest number of babies that a female spider gives birth to? Oh, that's a tough question. I I, I actually don't know the answer to that, but I, I would guess that it's like probably in the single thousands, like a thousand. Oh, wow. For those... I know the answer for scorpions, because I'm- I What's like, the answer I for scorpions? Prefer scorpions. Um, the answer for scorpions is is the maximum is about 150 and that's like 150 babies that you give live birth to and then they crawl up on your back um so that seems like a lot that was actually Accent. one of our questions from perla yeah. oh perla we know you get off this chat yeah <laughs> um hey perla okay. <laughs> sarah m uh asks oh is this kind of interesting is so is nuptial gift a phrase that's only used for arachnids or do you hear it with other animals as well I don't think it's just exclusive to arachnids. I think that there's other animals that also do provide some sort of nuptial gift. Are there ar non-spider arachnids that do nuptial gifts? <clears throat> no. I mean, I'm sure some arachnologist is gonna tell me later that that's not true, <laughs> but, but I don't, not that I know of. Okay. Um, so this one is from Frederick B and he says, um, or asks for the spiders who do the bridal veil, it seems that the veil doesn't prevent the females from eating the male, but maybe offers some assurance that she won't. Are there any theories around this at all? It seems so strange. Yeah, I think, so there's a few things that, that have been hypothesized uh, about what, what that veil actually is. Um, one of it's sort of like, yeah, like a mutual assurance. Like, it, like is, it's gonna take her like an extra second to break free in which time he can make his escape. So it's like, okay, I'm gonna let you do this if it gives you some assurance that I'm not gonna immediately eat you. Um, and the other thing that, that has been hypothesized is that it's actually like just completely covered in pheromones. And so what he's doing is kind of like laying down these strands of pheromones on her that like really make her understand or help her understand that like what's happening is, is courtship, mm -hmm. not anything else. And so like maybe helps her want to re or be more willing to reproduce. Oh, that's wild. Nature, it gets really real like really fast um <laughs> in so from lillian in arachnid species where the male is hypothesized to serve as an energy force for energy source for the female or offspring wouldn't bigger males equal more energy 
Yeah, bigger males would equal more energy, but they're also like greater risk. So mm -hmm. uh, if the male is almost the size of the female, like there's probably some percentage of the time where the female doesn't win. Whereas if the male's like always small enough that he can, she can definitely overpower him, then there's a higher percentage of the time that she always wins. Right, okay. Um, this one's from Brady. Is there any evidence that spiders hear the acoustic signal of spiders and other species, even if they don't respond to them? Yeah, there, there's, there's um, definitely evidence that they are able to hear acoustic signals. And like, there's been some studies done on spiders that live kind of, they're like two different species and they just overlap for a part of their their distributions. Mm -hmm. And um, they've observed like how many times there's success, successful courtships. And it's not it's not very often, like it happens occasionally, but it's not very often. Right. And, and the only signaling that they're doing at that point is acoustic. So like the male's playing a, a sound and the female like either lets him approach or doesn't. And if he's not the same species, like equally as often she'll just turn away or if he gets close enough, she'll eat him. Hmm. Okay. Uh, Alan wants to know whether there's any relationship between how well a courtship dance is performed and whether that male spider is likely to get eaten. Uh, I think that there's it, not necessarily whether he's likely to get eaten, but whether he's likely to be allowed to to like mate to reproduce. Okay. So evidence that doing it well is advantageous, but not that doing it badly results in immediate death or punishment. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Like in the case of a of a black widow, for example, like if if he's not pl plucking the right song, like if she start if before he's really in her web, she starts mm -hmm. to aggressively react to his presence. Like he'll skedaddle, he'll get out of there quick. Okay. Like he only approaches when he's pretty sure that he's going to be successful. Okay, okay. Um, I'll do two more. Let's see. So Danielle would like to know: Are there medications already on the market that use arachnid venom? Are they all still in testing? They're all still in testing, and and we're like. Like the kind of exciting thing is we're in this revolution right now. Like just in the last uh, maybe five years, there's been some technological advancements that have occurred that have allowed for a greater understanding of of, of the components of venoms and what the potential uses of those could be. And we're like, but we're really in the discovery phase. Like we know we've discovered what, like 30 to 50% of arachnids and that 30 to 50% we've categorized the venoms of maybe like 0.1%. And in those categorized venoms, we only know the function of like maybe 0.1% of the ones that we've categorized. So like we're really just in this phase of discovery where like the sky's the limit as far as what we're able to find and, and the potential uses for it. That's so cool. And I saved this question, which is also from Lillian, who asked a bunch of really good ones. Thanks, Lillian. Um, are you doing venom research in your lab? And if yes, what kind are you interested in? So my, the, what my lab does is, is rather than uh, doing research about the, the potential medical uses of venom, what we're trying to do is, is create roadmaps for people that are biochemists that are doing medical research or biomedical researchers that are doing potential um, uh, pharmaceutical research about which directions they should look if they're interested in something in a venom that functions in a certain way. So um, because different lineages share a common ancestor and have inherited the like base plan of their venoms from that common ancestor. But then those venoms have kind of evolved through time and changed slightly in different ways. But let's say if you're interested in a venom that, that uh, 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 for some reason affects brain gliomas and you know that it occurs in this one scorpion, it would make sense if you're looking for one that, that affects perhaps other brain uh, cells, I mean, cancer cells in, in similar ways to look at the most close, closely related species to that one as like a first, a first step in discovering ones that, that work on the, the particular kind of cancer that you're interested in. Um, so we're trying to create that roadmap, like if you have this one that does this one thing that works really well, which ones should you turn to next? Uh -oh. The world that those researchers have to, am I gone? Oh, you, you're back, you're back. It was just momentary. Am I back? Oh, okay. Um, I was just saying, tell me if it happens again, that, um, that roadmap is also so valuable because without it, like the size of what those researchers have to navigate and explore is pretty overwhelming, right? Yeah, the this, this scope is just like monumental. It's, I mean, it's basically like throwing darts at a dartboard in the dark. Right. Like okay. you might know kind of which direction it's in, but you're not going to hit the target. Right, yeah. And and again, so when we reopen, the Venom exhibit covers some of this. So that's another place to go if you yeah. uh, are interested. 
Uh oh, it got frozen. Am I back? Yeah, most, yes, now you're back, you're back, you're back. Okay. I hope it was like an attractive freeze, not like one of those really horrible half-lidded ones. I um, mean, you know, I'm so the entire country is on Wi-Fi right now, like bandwidth issues right and left. And if you have questions, leave them in comments. We'll work with Lauren to answer them later. Um, and then, so yeah, I'm gonna cut that. I'm gonna stop for now, obviously. <laughs> but uh, thank you so much to Lauren. Thank you for doing this. Yeah, thank you so much. And, and uh, I like Breakfast Club is awesome. So if anybody has requests for future talks aside from maternal care of arachnids, uh, let me know. Yeah, and you can see it's so, and you can also see like all the upcoming speakers we have planned. We'll drop a link to the full schedule and comments right now so you can see it. And um, I'll tell you, and just in closing, everyone, about two really cool things we have coming up. One is tonight, 7 p.m., right here, Pacific time. We're taking our regular 21 and Overnight Live series virtual. So tune in for artists, musicians, or DJs, shark science, cocktail recipes, more. And then um, at 10 a.m. tomorrow, Friday the 3rd, right back here for our next Breakfast Club session. This one's going to be with Dr. Rebecca Johnson and Allison Young. They are co-directors of our citizen science program. And they're awesome. And they're going to tell you about how you can take photos of nature anywhere, including just your own backyard if you're home. And uh, including jumping spiders in your backyard. Include, yeah, totally. And um, and like you can do it all ages. It's great for all ages. You'll learn a ton about the natural world by doing it. And also the photos that you take, the observations that you make um, are actually really helpful for research and um, conservation. So yeah, that's it. We'll see you tonight for Nightlife, tomorrow morning for Breakfast Club. And thanks so much to everyone again. Bye-bye. Bye, Lauren. Bye.